old brings a wealth of global health, education, and leadership, and scholarly activity to St. George's University, and his passion for providing high quality education to students uh, from various backgrounds and for advancing the mission of St. George's University, his quality of education, his leadership is undoubted. I would now like to invite Chancellor Monica, Chancellor of the University, to confer the presidency on President G. Richard Olds and to bestow on him the symbols of the office. Distinct honor, uh, as chairman of the board of directors and trustees, uh, on this day, 40 years after our first class started, to uh, present the uh, presidential medal to Dr. Olds as the first president of St. George's University. And I'm proud that the Prime Minister, Baroness Howell, Chancellor White, and Mr. Adams, all part of the history of this school. More importantly, this nation are here next to us for this photograph at this very historic, but not well planned. <laughs>
is as a result of that change in the organizational structure, St. George University will now have only one chancellor in the history of this institution. I want to take a special note to thank Chancellor Monica and the lovely wife Lisa.
to do together. And we are making that commitment as we move to the future. The other hallmark of, of our university that we plan to double down on is the commitment to student success. The single distinguishing feature of our school, distinguishing us from virtually every university that I have worked on in my professional career, is the deep commitment on the fact on the part of the staff and the faculty of this institution to the success of each and every student. That is what has made us great, and that was what we will make, make us even greater in the future as we increase the number of programs, success strategies uh, that we help our students to ultimately attain their success in all of our endeavors educationally. And I think that will be the hallmark of our future as well. And finally, one of the things that I was most impressed at, uh, with when I took this job was that not only is 1% of all the U.S. physicians alumni of this university, but 75% of the graduates of this university go into primary care fields, which are the very fields that our country needs. The average St. George graduate is twice as likely to practice in an underserved area, and will see twice as many Medicaid patients as the average U.S. graduate. I would say St. George... <laughs> I would say St. George University is already doing more for the United States than most U.S. medical schools, and we ought to be proud of that and double down on that. <laughs> now, you also expect the new president to have a few new ideas, and so I'll comment on three directions uh, I believe the university will be going, which are the same general directions we've been moving on, but we will need to do different things in the future be as successful as we've been in the past. The first is to be more geographic in our educational platform. Historically, most of the third and fourth year medical school was taught in New York and New Jersey, where today about 65% of our clinical platform is. But we are recruiting students from all over the United States and from 140 countries. And we need to develop an ever enlarging clinical platform that reflects the students that we are recruiting. And we need more places in California, Florida, Illinois, and in other countries where we are increasingly recruiting more students. The second thing is that it is no longer sufficient for us to work on the narrow part of the pipeline. We have the pre-med programs, and we have post-bac programs, and we have uh, wonderful transition programs for both the medical and veterinary schools in our college and arts and sciences. But that's not going to be enough. We have to build stronger programs on the front end of our university through partnership with universities around the world, such as the Cal State system, where we can offer students a six and a half year uh, program from freshman in college to the MD degree or veterinary degree. This not only decreases the cost of education, but accelerates the training of needed professionals for our world uh, uh, stage. We also need work on the other end. It is no longer adequate for us to just train doctors and hope that they get residency training programs after our graduation. We need to be actively involved in the expansion and growth of graduate medical education as well. In the United States, that is actually where the choke is on the manpower flow. We must be active in developing new residency programs in the locations that have the greatest needs and in the specialties which are at shortest supply. And that needs to be part of our future. And, and finally, the international aspect of our school. We are already the most international of all, if you will, in schools. We're 70% American and 30% uh, from 140 different countries. But we need to be more international. The dynamics that made us successful in the United States for the past 40 years exist in many other countries of the world. They need doctors as well. And we need to find a way to train physicians from those countries and find effective ways to return them to those countries so that we can provide the same manpower support for all the countries of the world that we do currently for the United States. By 2025, half of the students in this institution need to be non-Americans, and that's part of my commitment for the future. Let me close with some personal statements. I'm 
glad I didn't go immediately after that, that wonderful song. Uh, you don't know the half of it. it. I didn't ask for that song. Somebody obviously talked to my family. Uh, that was a song that was sung at my father's funeral. And so that was, I, I was having a hard time holding it together. I was looking over at my son Trevor. I had a sneaky suspicion that it came from him. Uh, that was my father's favorite song. And as uh, Chancellor White has already mentioned, my father was one of my greatest influences all my life. He was a president of three different universities in the United States. And uh, it's true, I, I learned many lessons from my father. And so I'm going to close with some personal comments about those that assume leadership positions, not only in higher education, but in life. We can't always anticipate what the future will hold, what difficulties will arise, what situations will demand of us. So it's important that we remember that in positions of responsibility, we have to make many tough decisions. And when tough decisions arise, it falls on us to think carefully about what the impact of those decisions are on the long-term future of our institution. Now some of you will visit my office and you will see a small three by five black and white photograph on my desk. It is a photograph of the commencement party from the 1964 Springfield College commencement. You will, of course, all recognize Dr. Martin Luther King. Most of you will not recognize my father, Dr. Glenn Oates. The story was even tougher than the FBI. He almost lost his job when the uh, Board of Trustees basically uh, were unhappy with that selection. And a donor ripped up a check for a million dollars uh, for giving this dangerous radical an honorary degree at the time the largest private donation ever offered to Springfield College. But ultimately, they had to do the right thing. And of course, in retrospect today, it always seems so simple, but we're often faced to make decisions for which no one will really know all the details. The details of that story that Dr. White told were not actually even known until 45 years later when the FBI files were finally declassified and the details were actually revealed. So we're often faced with making tough decisions. So I will end with a commitment to you, which is a quote from Dr. King himself, appropriate since this is his birthday today, that it's always the right time to do the right thing. Thank you and God bless you.